Ông quay cho. President, please be seated. Ông ở trong đại ca. The court is now back in session. And the floor is given to the international co-prosecutor for rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. President. We will try to address several points raised by the defense. The most important points we feel raised by the defense during their oral presentations uh, and also some that they didn't mention but that are in their written briefs. One of the points the defense made uh, concerned the prosecution arguments, my arguments, about the definition of genocide and how it applied to the CHAM. And the Nunchia defense said, well, this would amount to a violation of the principle of nulle crimen sin lege, the principle of legality that the prosecution was arguing for the chamber to convict Nunchia of some conduct that wasn't a crime at the time. It was committed in 1975. That's what that principle means, that you cannot convict someone of conduct if at the time they did the act, the conduct was not illegal. Your Honor, genocide was illegal in 1975. The Genocide Convention, which I was quoting from, that talks about the destruction of the group as such. Those are the words of the 1949 Genocide Convention. They're not new. I talked about the fact that the five genocidal acts, the groups of acts that are part of that convention that can amount to genocide, including include transferring children. So I pointed out the logic that, therefore, the destruction of the group cannot be limited simply to biological destruction. But clearly, by the terms of the 1949 Convention, you can destroy a group as such, such as a religious group, without necessarily killing the members of the group or all of the members of the group. The individuals can live on, but the group can be destroyed. We made the same point in our written submissions in more detail. Neither defense team has taken issue with the logic of our submissions, and we submit that is because it simply is logical. There's nothing to dispute about that interpretation. The words are clear. On ne saurait contester notre interprétation de ce terme. Also, to the genocide of the Cham, the Nunchia defense mentioned that they felt that the chamber excluded Crotch Chamar Security Center from the scope of the 2-2 trial to their disadvantage. But Your Honor has actually asked all parties to submit on the scope of the 2-2 trial before we began. None of the parties, including the defense of Kusum Khan and the defense of Nunchea, asked to include the Crotch Chamar Security Center. We wanted to do this trial as efficiently as possible, and we, didn't, uh, we wanted not to necessarily do every single site. We selected sites. Neither defense team asked to have Crotch Chamar included because there's nothing about including that that would have been to their advantage. They understood that then. The defense teams, both of them, I believe, also de made the general claim that Cham were arrested que as part of security concerns au titre of the de DK government, du as if, for du some reason, if you decide to destroy a group, Comme si, si that if you do it for reasons of the security of your nation, that's groupe. not genocide. Si that's not the case. In the Stockage Appeal Judgment, paragraph 45, they clearly distinguish intent for genocide from motive. Those are two different concepts. If you intend to destroy a group, it doesn't matter if you do it out of racial animus, you do it because you think the group is a threat, you do it for economic reasons, whatever reasons you do it for. If the intent is to destroy the group, that is genocide. And, Your Honors, the evidence we had in this case, in this trial, 
shows that the destruction of both the Vietnamese and Cham certainly was not done solely for security concerns. We've had evidence of children, for example, three and four-year-old children that Sang Khoi testified he transported to Wat Atrakun uh, to be killed. We've had evidence about Vietnamese babies being killed, the S-21 in uh, Sihanoukville. Clearly, these killings were not done for security concerns. They did not in any way further the security of the DK regime. Also, the defense pointed out, oh, how can there be a genocide of the Cham because there was a Cham in a fairly high mid-level or higher level position within the CPK, that being Mat Li. And oh, this shows that there wasn't discrimination. But actually, the prosecution case has always been, as we've explained, that the policy towards the jam evolved over time. And the evidence has shown that. And many witnesses that came and testified at the trial, including Issa Osman, the expert, talked about the fact that jam actually joined the Khmer Rouge movement in high numbers. Many of them were loyal to King Sihanouk, and they were opposed to the Lan Nol regime. Many of them joined the regime. But over time, starting in about 1973, the CPK increasingly began a policy of trying to destroy the Cham religious and cultural traditions. And Matt Lee, for example, certainly doesn't help the defense. In interviews, one of the things he talked about was a 1974 Congress that he attended, in which Pol Pot was also there. And Matt Lee mentioned uh, it would be nice to allow Cham to bury their dead according to their own tradition, which is different than the Khmer tradition. The Cham, the body is buried with the head to the north and the foot to the south. And he told the interviewer that Pol Pot called him aside after the Congress scared him. Paul Pot told Matt Lee, since we had joined the revolution, how the body was buried was up to the revolution. And that's consistent with what the witnesses said. Beginning in 73, but much more after 1975 and the Khmer Rouge I apologize to interrupt, Mr. President. Um, but I do like uh, the prosecution um, when they cite documents in rebuttal, which I'm not quite sure they actually cite in their brief, at least uh, indicate to us the E3 number. I presume it's Matthew's interview to Ben Keenan, uh, but I'm not quite sure. I'll try to do that, Your no, Honor. No, no, we appreciate it if, uh, uh, if the defense does the same. I think it may be too late for us now on that. But the interview I just mentioned, in fact, was with DC Cam, and that's E3 slash 7 but Paul, but counsel is absolutely correct. Matt Lee also spoke to Ben Kiernan. Also in E3 slash 390, Matt Lee talked about what happened to his own family under the Pol Pot regime. He said he lost, he said Pol Pot killed my wife three of my children, three children-in-law, nine grandchildren, three of whom were infants. So Matt Lee does not help the defense, this example of Matt Lee. Again in E3-7821, he was asked if there was a policy against the Cham, and he said yes. Not only were the Cham targeted, but he also mentioned the Vietnamese as being targeted. He said even more badly by the regime. Now, the defense spent quite a bit of time, the Nunchea defense, talking about the theories of communism and socialism, and how these are Theoret, uh, designed the theory to ensure prosperous 
egalitarian societies. La prospérité, l'égalité au sein de la société. And that cooperatives are often a part of communist or socialist regimes. Your honors, Nunchea and Kusampan are not charged here with being communists. They're not here because they were bad economists, although they were. They're here not because they set up cooperatives, not because of that alone, but because they set up cooperatives where people were enslaved, where they were denied fundamental freedoms. They were required to work without remuneration in inhumane conditions. And with the fear of execution if they did not comply with all of these requirements. The accused persons are not here simply because of the theories that they, the politics that they espouse. Many countries around the world espouse socialism or communism, but they didn't have the results the policies, the infliction of suffering upon the people that this regime did. One document that was admitted at the request of the Nunchia defense is a demographic study by Patrick Pavelin. That's E3-10764. And it's the most recent and I submit the most comprehensive attempt to look at demographic data to estimate the number of lives lost during the VK regime. And Havelin, being a uh, very precise academic, points out that, of course, it's not possible to state specifically how many died, but from the data, you can, he was able to conclude that the number of excess deaths had to fall within the range of 1.2 million to 2.8 million, with the median value of 1.9 million, about 21 percent of the population. So this was not a typical socialist Ce n'était donc pas un régime socialiste ou communiste Les accusés ne sont pas ici à cause de certaines politiques ou théories économiques, mais bien à cause des souffrances infligées au peuple cambodgien et à cause des décès. Je veux corriger quelque chose que j'ai compris, de la traduction au moins, que le Q-Sampan Defense a dit ce matin. They said that the prosecution in paragraph 932 of our brief had cited two confessions from S21 or from Tramcock. Your Honor, we have never used confessions from these security centers to prove the truth of their contents. We didn't do that in paragraph 932. The two documents that counsel cites, if I understood her correctly, E3-861, is just a report listing that Ewan hid in the rubber plantation bases. It is not a confession. The other document cited was E3-861. 32434. Excuse me. Um, I think she said 2443. And that's another document. That, that's what's in our brief. 2443 in paragraph 932. That's just a Tramcock district document listing names of Vietnamese in the local communes. The document that she cited is a very similar number, 2434, was not in that paragraph. We cited it elsewhere in our brief, but only for the fact, in talking about how the security centers worked, that um, that, that the, the 
statements were passed on up the chain of command to the more senior leaders. What we said in that, supreme. we cited it uh, in our brief in footnotes 32-45 and the following footnote for the propositions that every confession was recorded and summarized in a notebook, and secondly, that these summaries were then signed up and delivered to the district office. So we certainly agree with the Q. Sampan defense that it is absolutely improper Donc, to use comme contents of confessions from these security centers, for as I will explain, these are all the product of torture. Sous la torture. Also, the Q. Sampan defense la de Q. Sampan. says that we relied on WRIs, I understood them, for the majority of our submissions on the Vietnamese. That also is not true. If you look at our section on the treatment of Vietnamese, there are 534 footnotes. 513 times we cite to trial testimony. Now, the Nunchia defense said there's nothing in the documents to indicate a policy against the Vietnamese. They did not address Pol Pot's speech about killing 50 million Vietnamese. The army of Vietnam didn't number 50 million. That was the population of the entire country. Also, they did not address, if we can have the slide, please. Um, of E3-1094, this document, which was a report from the West Zone, we mentioned it in our oral submissions already, but they did not address it. But in that document, it, the West Zone reported that it had applied the party's line to routinely remove, screen, and sweep clean enemies by screening for UN aliens. It says aliens. It doesn't say soldiers. It doesn't even say spies, as they like to call civilians. It simply says UN aliens. And what were the results according to that report? It indicated smashed 100 ethnic UN including small and big adults and children. So this document makes absolutely clear we have a written report to the center saying we are fulfilling the center's policy against the UN and we're killing them, including children. But perhaps no document is more telling about the policy and about the genocide of the Vietnamese than E3-4604. That is the Revolutionary Flag magazine for April 1978. In that magazine, <coughs> they wrote, and now, how about the UN? There are no UN in Kampuchea territory. Formerly, there were nearly one million of them. Now, there is not one seed of them to be found. I just heard that um, loud bang, and perhaps I'm wondering if the Nunchea defense thinks that there's a coup, because when a grenade goes off, they believe there's a coup. But I'll come back to that in just a moment. I just thought I'd take advantage of the sound to preview my argument on that. Your Honors, the defense also talked about, challenged a policy to destroy Buddhism. And if I understood, if I recall correctly, they said that there were no witnesses about monks being defrocked, that we didn't call witnesses who themselves were defrocked. There were several witnesses in this case who were defrocked. Chin Sarun testified on the 3rd of August 2016. He said, yes, it was after the 17th of April 1975 that I was defrocked, but I was told to leave the monkhood because the regime said that there would be no more monks in the regime. Kiev knew, testified on the 21st of June 2012, 
He said, when we were ordered to disrobe, we just did that so we could survive. He said, a group of Khmer Rouge came to instruct all the monks in Ang Rakar Pagoda to leave their monkhood. M. Fong, the defense did mention him. He testified on the 16th of February, 19, uh, 2015. As for leaving the monkhood, all monks did not dare to refuse. We were afraid because there were instructions from Ankar, and if we didn't follow it, it would be a matter that we had to concern about. Chiu Chuan, a witness requested by the defense, said he was a monk, and he said, um, well, he said he was forced to disrobe, and that if he could, he would return to Buddhism. Si possible, il Mien Lui, 2nd of September 2015, testified in the morning the Khmer Rouge soldiers, who were the messengers of the district chief, came to insist that we should leave the monkhood, that we would not be allowed to be in monkhood anymore in the near future. And if we look at a CPK document, E3-99, it's a document about the follow-up of implementation of the political line, stated 22 September 1975. And the party wrote in that document, most of the monks, from 90 to 95 percent of them, abandoned their monkhood. Pagodas, which are the core foundations for the existence of the monkhood, were abandoned. People no longer have gone to the pagoda. They no longer offer alms. We assume that 90 to 95 percent of the monks and Buddhist practices will no longer exist. So this special layer of the society will no longer cause any worry. Now the defense position is, oh, this was just a voluntary decision by the Cambodian people and by the monks to abandon the religion. What sense does that make? At a time when people needed religion most, why would they give up the religion? We know today Cambodians continue to practice Buddhism. The only reason Buddhism did not exist for the three years and eight months of the DK regime was because it was forcibly prohibited by the regime. In fact, M. Phong even testified that while he himself was able to avoid this because he was well known, other monks were forced to marry. One of his friends was forced to get married. Now there also were some defense legal arguments about other inhumane acts. Several of the charges in this case concern this residual category of crimes against humanity. I don't want to get too technical. We discussed that in our brief and we've done it in prior briefs. And there's a lot of jurisprudence already from this tribunal and others. But other inhumane acts was a crime in 1975. That's absolutely clear. It's a residual category because international law has said we don't leave vacuums for cruel perpetrators to make up conduct that wasn't yet called inhumane and get away with it. When conduct rises to the level of other inhumane acts, that is a crime. So other types of treatment have been considered, besides forced marriage, for example, uh, as other inhumane acts. Cruel, humiliating, inhumane, or degrading treatment. There's cases which we cite in our brief that call those uh, other inhumane acts. Forced prostitution has been found to be an other inhumane act. Inflicting serious mental injury Inflicting deplorable conditions of detention 
forcing coups, people to witness criminal acts against family or friends, and forced nudity. All of these have been examples of conduct that was found to rise to the level of other inhumane acts. Now, the defense, particularly the defense for Q Sampan, spent a long time yesterday arguing Oh, forced marriage doesn't rise to that level. It's not so serious. And they, Your Honours, we've had the testimony of the victims of forced marriage. This is something that has changed people's lives. It was extremely traumatic at the time it occurred, and for many it has left scars that last a lifetime mental scars, and in some cases, even physical scars. One of the witnesses you will recall was a man who talked about how he ran into his former fiancé, and they both talked about all that they had lost by this forced marriage policy, where he was forced to marry someone else. And all they could conclude is that perhaps in the next life they would be together. So this conduct, which affects families, it affects the children from those families, certainly rises to the level of another inhumane act. It was extremely, extremely serious and cruel conduct. I also want to talk about the two experts who testified because the defense teams misrepresented or selectively represented what they testified to in a way that distorts uh, the value of their testimony. First, I want to talk about the witness requested by the Q. Sampan defense, Peg Levine. It's true, she said she does not characterize the weddings as forced. She did this study where she said she, quote, worked very hard to not even ask, unquote, couples whether they felt their marriages were forced or not. So how could she possibly come to a conclusion when she didn't ask the people, she wasn't there, didn't ask the people involved, did they consent, did they feel forced in these weddings? And she actually testified that most of the interviews she conducted were done by students. They weren't a random selection of people from the DK regime. She sent out students who talked to friends of their parents. So we had young people talking to more elderly people. And we saw her protocol of the questions to ask, and none of them concerned whether the couples consented to the marriage or not. As she said, she avoided asking that question. And yet, despite the fact that she didn't ask them in the interviews, some of the uh, responses make it absolutely clear that these couples were forced to marry. Two men said that they first refused to be married and they were punished for that by hard labor. Other witnesses said that they married the spouse chosen by the authorities because one said they could not protest. Another said that she did not agree, but she was afraid of being killed, so she agreed. A third said, I had to follow Ankar or I would be killed. A fourth told Levine, or one of her students, she did not agree, but said Ankar killed people. And a fifth older woman told her that she said she felt she must marry or she would be killed. And yet somehow Levine says she does not consider these marriages forced even though the Et people told her they married because they were afraid they'd be killed if they refused. She even talked about a woman named Moni. Moni was a highly educated. She worked for the Khmer Rouge preparing lists 
of people to be killed. She was ordered to marry an uneducated base person and she didn't want to marry him, she said. She told Levine she didn't want to marry anyone for that matter. She said she only went through with that wedding because her father told her, if you refuse, they're going to kill me. Si tu refuses, so Levine's tu. evidence make it, makes it absolutely clear Donc, that these marriages Levine were forced. Clair, People married because forcé. in the incredibly hostile, the terror environment of the DK regime, you simply did not refuse euh, an instruction from the authorities, from Ankar. To do that would have consequences that people faire, uh, did not know what they would be, but they were afraid, reasonably, could even lead to their death. Peur, the other witness, Ms. Nakagawa, said that she started her research on sexual violence. And she was